One, two. That was a pretty cool intro. Y'all can hear me okay, right? Before we start, let's make some noise for all the presenters today, people. Please do. All right. Before I get going, I need y'all to make me feel like I'm in a hip-hop environment. So when I say hip, y'all say hop. Hip. Hip. And when I say don't, I need y'all to say stop. Don't. Don't. Y'all say hip and then y'all say hop. Hip, hop, hip, hop. And when y'all say don't, I need y'all to say stop. Don't, stop, don't, stop. It's hip hop in the room. Make some noise, party people. <laughs> so, due to the technologies that we had in the room, it wasn't really possible for me not to hear some of the words that you were saying. I wanted to make uh, you all aware of the communal spirit of hip hop. And what we do a lot of times is incorporate the element that's in the room. And so even when I speak today, don't pay too much attention to the slides that will come up later because I want to improvisationally capture some of what was going on. So I might speed up the presentation a bit to hit some things that I otherwise didn't have planned. But education should not be a one-way force-fed predetermined lecture, right? It should be a two-way street. And so that's what we do in hip hop, in the culture of hip hop. So I don't have a beat, but that doesn't stop us in hip hop from overcoming. And that's part of the culture. It's about struggle and overcoming. I'm holding the mic right now like an MC. You typically will see an MC hold the microphone with their finger out front like this. And sometimes it sounds like we're eating the mic, but that's because we came up as beatboxers. We learned when we didn't have music, we went <gasps> because we didn't have a drum set, <laughs> right? So we just improvised. So let me turn around and see what you have before my eyes. I see the word collaboration on the stage that rhymes with my group's name. It's actually Invasion. And the place that I live, yes, I represent Cambridge. And the name is Lyrical Lord Plaud the Inspiration, but not really semi-famous. But in the amalgamation of the participation of all the people that we've had today, it comes to a collaboration. I want to end the show and have a standing ovation and have all the party people give me some participation. That is the connection when we reach perfection. The inspiration on the stage for me is the initial inception to take what you started and end it right here. Lyrically off the top of the head with no hair. Yeah, that was my gear. I wore a hat to be in my rap mode. But when I'm a professor, I'm on the stage and I let it explode. The stage can be the classroom or we can be in the chat room and we can talk about mooks like my man over there, Woody. Off the top of the head, they said, would he? Really incorporate the names of the people. I'm seeing things off the front of the stage. I want to jump off it like we're here in the steeple or the chapel off the top of the head with no scapel even though my hair is kind of tight to the top I have to rock the community like I did at the beginning when I said hip to the hop and you don't stop and then finally at the end of course off the head party people in the place I want to make y'all say yes because old school we say yes yes y'all you don't stop you keep on rock to the break of dawn and you don't stop you keep on on and on and on and that's hip hop lyrical got it going on Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I think um, I think y'all can hear me now, right? Switching, switching the microphone. So, real briefly, <laughs> I need to take a litmus test because I wouldn't have known that this is in a hip hop room with all that participation. So, but right now I want to watch something here. On the count of three, like we would do in a hip hop show, if it appeals to you, if this is true to you, if this is your truth, make some noise on the count of three. Ready? All of y'all who are brought up and consider yourselves a piece or a product of hip hop culture, on the count of three, make some noise. One, two, three. Yeah. Wow. That was like 20% of y'all. I wasn't really expecting that, but. That's good, so I can skip through some of the, the main things I want to talk about, but some of the things that I do want to cover just to make sure that everybody's on the same playing field is that, first of all, my name is Professor Lyrical. Let's continue the conversation. Like, the conversation can go well after this. It can go on a cipher. Actually, a cipher is kind of a, uh, a get-together where MCs share their, their talent. We'll get in a circle. We don't just freestyle. That's kind of like a party trick. We actually come with written rhymes, right? And freestyle, informs what we will rhyme about and sometimes vice versa. Like the mood today will inspire me to go home and write new material. See, hip hop is a culture and we're inspired by the people who are around us. A lot of times what we see in the media, excuse my French, is a bastardized version of rap music. And rap music, when, when it's embodied within the culture of hip hop, 
it, it doesn't take on the meaning that it, that it now tends to have when you listen to mainstream radio. When we see this corporate consolidation that has taken place um, in the music industry, not just for hip hop, across all realms of the music industry, in fact, we see the big six labels when I was growing up turn into like the big three, right? There's like three record labels right now that run the whole show. But in hip hop, we have this collective consciousness that we kind of know before it happens what's going to become the trend. We pay attention when a rapper who's, who's looked at, or an MC more correctly, who's looked at and respected says something or does something, it sort of changes the mode and the consciousness that's in place and becomes sort of the ethos of what another MC might build upon. There's this constant building and going back to our elders. When I, when I talk to you about hip hop, we're concerned about struggle. We're always concerned about the struggle. Hip hop comes from a place where people who didn't have means really had to overcome and figure it out. It's literally about the science of making something from nothing. And I heard a lot of people today talk in similar fashion. We had music from my friend right there in the back dedicated with some art right here, right? And that's what hip hop does. At a hip hop event, hip hop would be about the struggle and people's struggle would be broadcast from the MC on stage talking about the reality. You know, we think of back to some of the old school pioneers and they said, broken glass everywhere. People were talking about what was going on in their community. In the 1970s, early 1970s, around 1973, you had a gentleman by the name of Cool Herc. And Cool Herc was from Jamaican ancestry, came to New York around 1973. That's how old hip hop is, over 40 years, if you do the math at home. <laughs> Back in around 1973, he's throwing jams in the tradition of Jamaican culture from, uh, from a family of Jamaican immigrants. It wasn't rap music. Hip hop culture wasn't even a word yet. Hip hop was a word that developed later, but hip hop is not rap music. It started as an amalgamation. <laughs> to use that word. It started as an amalgamation of, of different sources, you know, uh, of people indigenous to Jamaica partying, doing Jamaican dance hall kind of music with a selector, which is the, the slang for the DJ name, would be the person reading the crowd. Like, I'm reading the vibe of you guys right now to determine what it is that I will talk about. If I get a chance to say another rhyme with you guys that I've written, I will incorporate what I think and feel that you guys want to say. Even if it's a written rhyme, I'm going to choose from something that I have that I think matches you and sort of like a car salesman would read you, right, when they're trying to, <laughs> to sell you a car. I want to say something that you're going to enjoy. So from my arsenal of written rhymes, I'll pick something that I have. And in hip hop, we talk about the four elements of hip hop to make it a culture. And the, the traditional four elements of the culture isn't just the DJing and the, and the creation of a Jamaican influence of two turntables and blending the breaks of records to extend the cool parts of the records when you didn't have a band. That is amazing in itself. That's what Cool Herc started in the South Bronx. But then there were B-boys and B-girls, or I should say B-girls and B-boys, dancing over the extended breaks. So added into this culture, you know, people needed to have an outlet. People needed to have a, a way of, of expressing themselves. Visually, artistically, martial arts were a big thing on TV in the late and mid 70s. You could watch kung fu theater and shows like this. And there's no wonder why B-boys and B-girls incorporated over the cool breaks that were being played these highly acrobatic dance moves, right? That when you watch a b-boy or a b-girl, when I say b-boy or b-girl, by the way, b stands for breaks, the breaks that the DJ was playing. So you're actually, it's a, it's a misnomer when you say break dance, even though we'll call it break dance just because sort of mainstream media has done that. A break dancer is essentially someone who's breaking. And the, the, the break dancer label was something that mainstream media kind of cast upon. So when you say, hey, there's a break dancer, just so you know, you're actually insulting a break dancer. You'd call, <laughs> you'd call them a b-boy or a b-girl. And literally, they have their little b-boy moves and stuff, and they'll start this spin. I'm not going to do it for you. But, but the environment, though, is important. The environment that was taking place. There was art taking place because we didn't maybe have a canvas in the tools. And I say we as part of a product of hip hop culture, not like I was there in the 70s, right? But like, if you didn't have a canvas, you overcame. You took sheets in your bedroom and you painted on them. You did them in the jam and the paints did become just like this that happened earlier today with beautiful art being created off the inspiration of the mood that was in the room. It wasn't about vandalizing and graffiti. When you think graffiti, you almost synonymously think vandalism because we say, oh, those little hoodlums, they're out spray painting on the buildings. Partly yes, but not everybody had the guidance that they needed. My proposition to everybody here is if you raised your children under the tenets of true hip hop culture, you would find the kids would grow up wanting to be master craftsmen in their trade. If I took, I have a one year old, I can't wait to take my one year old to a b-boy jam and show him how the masters, b-boys and b-girls get down and master their art on the floor. 
Hopefully he wants to be an MC like me. <laughs> Hopefully he'll want to be a wordsmith and get into words and freestyle and writing and thinking about your thoughts. But these things are no different to me than mastering sort of what I call four pillars of truth. A lot of you today talked about things that inspire me and things that I look at. Like when I teach math, I teach math full time at Northeastern University. I've had an opportunity to teach 85 courses over literally about six years, 25 of them at Northeastern. And I hustled into education. I started out as a teacher in my hometown of Lowell, Massachusetts, because they knew I was the local MC who could maybe grab the attention of the kids and I was good at math. And so I started out as a high school math teacher, but my hustle was trying to get into higher education as well. So I started, like most people, adjuncts, <laughs> and uh, lived that crazy adjunct world, and was literally going from place to place while working on my masters in mathematics at UMass Lowell. It was a hustle. I was emceeing, but I had the ear of the youth. I speak the truth. That, you know, like, I don't want to get into the rhyme, but, but <laughs> I had the ear of kids. And so I could say, look, math is cool. Science and technology and engineering and mathematics are just one pillar of truth. For me, they're the ones that resonate with me the most. When I think of, when I think of quantum mechanics, when I think of nanotechnology, I think the closest thing we have today to magic. <laughs> like if you really understand what's going on at a quantum level where particles act like waves and waves act like particles and consciousness can affect what's going on, I see people nodding their heads, so I'm preaching to the choir, literally. <laughs> but, but these four pillars, like science, technology, engineering, mathematics, is just one path to get towards a truth about the fundamentals of the universe that we don't fully understand. But you can't even get to be in the discussion as a young kid if you don't have a basic framework. I mean, uh, Woody was talking earlier about calculus. If a kid doesn't understand the basics of calculus, which I agree can be taught almost in a tutorial fashion, doesn't need to be an educator. Uh, it could be a computer, it can be a simulated book. If a kid doesn't have those fundamentals, that is the threshold that you cannot walk past to make sure that you're in the game where your discussion even matters. If you wanna talk to somebody intelligently artistically uh, talk about pedagogy, curriculum, or you want to do something that's important in education and you want to do it in STEM, you have to complete the calc sequence, right? We can watch this cool crap that goes on on TV and in the movies and science fiction, but if you don't have a, a, a background in, in math, you're somewhat taken out of the conversation. So for me, sure, one of my pillars is math, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. But I'm just as interested in philosophy like some of you were speaking about today. I equate it to some of the four pillars of hip hop. And MC is like a philosopher to me. At least we try to be. <laughs> we, try to, we try to impart and incorporate different vibes that we hear into the discussion like, like I did earlier. And I was thank, thankful you guys were participating. I'd be remiss if I didn't discuss spirituality in this room. Um, talking about theology, it's just another path of truth. It's trying to get to an understanding about the reality of where it is that we come from. Hip hop and hip hoppers are obsessed with that. B-boys and B-girls, it's like a ritual, which is part of the word spirituality if you look at it. It's like a ritual mastering your craft, but it's almost spiritual. It's almost a spiritual experience for B-boys and B-girls and for, and for art in general. So we talk about the arts. Of course, the arts are another pillar of truth. The speaker before me was speaking about that as well. Arts, it's a reality of trying to get through the tacit dimension of the other side of what's in your brain that you can't express properly, but you can do with paint or you can do with creative combinations of words and sounds or whatever your medium is for art. So when I'm speaking to students, I'm trying to convey to them that it doesn't matter what your pillar is, follow one of those as a discipline like you might do as a student or a b-boy or a b-girl or a DJ or an MC or one of the people that follows one of the four pillars of, of, of hip hop. It doesn't matter what your pillar is. It doesn't matter your path to try to get the truth. Let's not BS each other. We're here to hear truth. We're here to hear about things that really matter. To me, what really matters is in the sciences, in STEM, we have a lack of people who can do the job. You know, we have to hire from overseas to get qualified people to actually come in. Yet, and, and be in these, you know, when I graduated from UMass Lowell, I was one of very few from Lowell who graduated with a master's in mathematics. It wasn't cool. Math wasn't cool in the community I was from. If I wasn't lucky enough to get to move to Chelmsford, which was a suburb, to go to high school where math was cool, I wouldn't have to sneak my math skills in on the side. Most, ki most kids don't have that opportunity. It was cool for me to be like, Flipping and ribbing and shoving, nobody has ever been able to keep the lyrical skill. Like rhyming real, real fast. Or I'd sit in my room all day. When I'd be getting the rhythm and then I'd be really be getting my rhyming and making a miracle out of material lyrics. They've never been able to find and find and come out of the men on the physical that will come at the pinnacle medical mineral. Then I get into when no one has ever been able to go with the lyrical flow. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. That was cool. They liked it too. Yeah. 
They didn't like eight times seven is 56. 56 times three is 168, whatever it is. You can give me a number. Like, whatever it is. 310, it says on the clock. 310 times three is 930, but I got to wake up early in the morning for you to get me because I'm that wordy. You know, like that, taking the numbers and putting them into something cool was cool, but numbers by themselves wasn't. But DJs like Grandmaster Flash, I didn't know when I was growing up. I can't get this thing to fast forward. DJs, when I was growing up, I didn't know that Grandmaster Flash himself was an engineer in college. Nobody told me that. Grandmaster Flash, for those of you who don't know, was a legendary DJ, okay? He basically took a turntable and added on to the art of a turntable. We talk about overcoming and making something out of nothing, right? You don't have a band? <laughs> Get two turntables, extend those breaks, right? Flash took the line switch off of a microphone and engineered it into a crossfader so that you could literally extend the brakes and make that what, 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 what music when you're turning the, the fader on and off. This was, this was engineering. You tell that to a kid, you have an entry point. You don't need to do fancy stuff in the classroom like jump around and juggle and rap and gargle water and like spin on your head. You just need to speak to kids from a cultural ideology that says, yeah, I understand your culture. See, all of you, could teach in my college, in my university that I propose to open, which will be Hip Hop University. <laughs> All of you could, but I'm gonna make you pass a test, a high stakes test, not just a regular teacher test. You have to show me that you're down with hip hop culture. <laughs> Culture isn't something you're born into all the time. Culture can be something you come into. My parents, you might guess, were not like chicka chicka like that. <laughs> you know? Was not, when they saw me like doing poetry in first grade, you know, and, and trying to rap and be creative and do all this kind of stuff when I was a young kid, they were like, who is this kid? <laughs> but for me, it's about increasing STEM degree attainment, basically for, for traditionally marginalized populations. And so, you know, that's a population that I come from. I'm from Lowell, Massachusetts, and one of my good friends, I'd be remiss again if I didn't mention him, his name is DJ Defrock. I don't know if any of you heard of him, but he lives in Portsmouth. He was a person who put me on in the 80s. And he's a legend, legend, does all, uh, three, um, three actual uh, skills. But like, I come from Lowell, and Lowell, as some of you may know, is famous for High on Crack Street, <laughs> and, which was a documentary on HBO. Check it out if you get a chance. You know, it's the little things. It's the little things you do in a classroom to grab a kid's attention. If you have a rapper in the classroom speaking to kids about STEM, they're gonna be interested in STEM. You know, when Barack Obama gave a fist pump to Michelle after winning the election, a lot of kids were like, this is an article that's been written by a colleague of mine talking about the Obama effect, right? Kids were like, oh, he's down with hip hop? Oh yeah, okay. So what I have up on the screen is sort of my take on how I feel that you know, education and institutions have to sort of flip the script a little bit because they've historically been about changing the student, right? Like we say, oh, this kid doesn't have the culture of academe, so we need to make them you know, graduate. Toward. That's not working. You know, yeah, you have to let them know what the culture of academe is, but you don't have to speak it and wear it 24-7. You know, so get some hip-hop people in the classroom and have them start uh, running the lectures, so to speak. So for me, I say it in a different way. I flip it around my own way. I say this, as I'm kind of showing you here. Educators and institutions need to change the classroom or campus system entirely. Therefore, I propose my university. HHC University, hip hop culture, right? And so that's what I, that, that's really what I'm about. I have some, I, I know we're probably pretty short on time, but I have some things I would share with you real briefly. Authentic hip hop culture to increase STEM degree attainment is very easy. It's small things in the classroom. It's acknowledgement of the people that you have in front of you and their culture and letting their culture be cool in the classroom as opposed to being a foreign entity that is not welcome in, in, in academia. There are other elements to hip hop. I'll show some of you real quickly what they are. Those are the traditional nine elements of hip hop if you add them on to the original four. But those have parallels <laughs> in the real world of degrees that are offered at many colleges with there's many entry points into. Um, you know, I have a book that's all about this. It's called Put Them All to Shame. I took my album and all my songs and I correlated it to all the chapters in the book. I call it an owl book. And I wrote about some of those entry points. You know, one of the entry points for me has always been the history of the music industry, how it basically is an enslavement situation where you have a label making $10 traditionally for when they sell a CD and the artist gets one. And the artists are lining up to do this. Like, please let me be down. <laughs> let me get $1, right? Get a million dollar advance, you have to basically sell back a million records to actually pay off your advance. Nine dollars, meanwhile, go into the label that the label's clearing in profit. I teach this lesson in my classroom. I, I was lucky enough to have uh, Chronicle of Higher Education come in and do a piece on me when I was doing this at Northeastern, and it got some publicity, and I know other educators are using the same lesson. It's a little bit more advanced than what I'm showing you here, but basically the idea is if, why are kids rushing 
into these crazy label deals, right? When you got to pay back like $1,200,000 on a standard deal, at least in the old model when you were selling CDs, you know, just to break even. And by, by the time you're breaking even, the label's, you know, making over $10 million. You know, if you do the math on the other side, that's a bad investment that you wouldn't want to get into. When you get, if you want to talk about investment and business and economics, which was my undergraduate interest in marketing, you know, you have a great entry point in the screwed up mathematics <laughs> of the music industry and how it still to this day enslaves, I will use that word, that's a strong word, but it enslaves the artist, the artist is at the end of the food chain and literally is making a dollar profit after they sell back those 1,200,000 uh, copies. That for me is, is, is not a cool marketing plan. That's not a cool business plan to be in unless you want to convince a kid that you should be on the other side of the desk, <laughs> right? Why don't you be on the executive side of the desk and get some of that street entrepreneurialism into your, into your hustle? Because this just isn't doing it for me. And when kids find out, basically the end of the joke here, it is a joke, it, in fact, it's a sad joke, that you're gonna owe money after your first album, even if you've gone platinum. What you're realizing is that what you've seen on TV is a lie coming from the powers that be, from the clear channels, from the live nations of the world that are, cons not to say that they're evil people, but the business mechanism is basically consolidation of the media and the airwaves that young kids are not even aware of. Bring a 17-year-old into your class and tell them that Universal essentially is GE, right? And that it essentially is NBC, and oh, by the way, it's essentially going to be Comcast. <laughs> and they're gonna go, what? Really? And I know that's not a one-for-one one truth, but it's pretty true. Like, that's pretty true. Different amalgamations of those corporations coming together are one company, one voice for all the diversity that we have in hip-hop and all the topics that we want to talk about. You know, that's, that's the quote from my book where I basically say that. That's the truth. I'll leave you with this uh, little lesson. I've been having a little bit of trouble here trying to get it there. But sorry about that. So if you want to reach out real quickly, even if any of you, any educators in the room? No, make some noise. Any educators in the room? All right, all right. raising their hand, like, yes, Professor Lyrical. Yeah. <laughs> it's hip hop, people, right? We make noise in the classroom. We have a cipher, okay? All right, so cool. Check this out, and I'll, I'll leave you with this. I, I know we gotta get going, but this is a rhyme that I quote from, from a song of mine, all right? I'm gonna try to quote the rhyme here. Let me get going fast forward a little bit. This is what I say, so you can at least see the words. I'm gonna say the words, and then I'm gonna translate the words into high brows English prose. <laughs> Okay, fun exercise, because it takes the kids who are grammatically smart into literature and so forth, into like classic Shakespearean poetry, and gives them some cultural capital in the classroom, as well as the hip hopper and the rapper and the lyricist. The rapper and lyricist can help you translate what the song means into highbrows English prose. Kind of a fun exercise to do if you haven't done it before, all right? So it goes something like this. My flow's preposterous, impossible. Novice is one of the copy. This imposter's posing lyrical, but they're marketing and posturing. But I'm over in the genre of the Dalai Lama, Mahatma Gandhi, maybe be Molly's baby mama mixed with some Salvador Dali, literally in Da Vinci with it. Lyrics, Leonardo life. Beautiful as a Halle Berry, but leaving with my model wife. Whoo, a lot of my life has been dedicated to excellence. My regiments have been well documented as evidence. I never been one of them rappers about hating, fear, and spitting. Now the written's more quoted than Shakespeare and Dickens. An architect directing up a Taj Mahal marvelesque monument, a master of ceremonial novelists. Mighty as hard rockers, the problem has never been confidence, it's modesty. Too much cash money, not enough marvelous. Too many rem and ask them all topics and on the prophet, so it's ironic they never be talking about Jesus, Buddha, or Muhammad. Okay? So. <laughs> translation, translation, this is my translation, so other kids might be able to do it better. What I really said was, breaking that all back down for you in order, was something more like this. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. I am largely categorized amongst the same artistically and philosophically gifted men of distinguished excellence and repertoire, widely considered as the greatest worldly spiritual leaders of their times. That's fun, right? Getting to translate that, that into there. Further, when comparing my prowess to more modern talents of the Americas, I am often couched within parallelisms, harking back to immensely talented musical freedom fighters such as Bob Marley and the tormented and persecuted rap folk soul genius of one Miss Lauren Hill. <laughs> It is perhaps worthwhile to note that Robert Marley's son, Rohan, and Miss Hill have offspring of their own. <laughs> One can only imagine the prodigious abilities and cultural impact a child of Miss Hill and grandchild of Mr. Marley could have on the world. 
HHC University. That's my proposal.